All right. Well, it's so good to see everyone. I think I think this is the first day of summer. I, I don't know. I feel like I might be a day off. I'm not sure. But welcome to Almost Summer <laughs> um, with Visible Network Labs. And we're just really happy to have everyone here today. Um, we have a special webinar today that is being hosted by Alex Durr, our Director of Marketing and Communications here at Visible Network Labs. And I'm Danielle Varda. I am our CEO and founder. Um, and I'm going to just kind of get us started with a little bit of background about what we are, do and why we're doing this. Um, and uh, it is my uh, pleasure to actually introduce Alex today. He has been with Visible Network Labs for some time and is just an absolute gem for us. He um, came to us as a student of mine at the university and then started learning all about SEO and digital marketing and has just... Um, taken us to a whole different level and I learn from him every day and I think you'll find his enthusiasm and just um, real strong expertise in this area is going to be something that you'll find really valuable. Um, so I'll just say a quick few words about Visible Network Labs. We are um, an organization that is around uh, to make invisible networks visible. We believe in the power of seeing and measuring these networks that we're all embedded in, and we know that they're really um, invisible most of the time. So our goal is to offer services and trainings and workshops like today um, to help folks uh, support their work around network building, collaboration and ecosystem mapping. Um, so we do things like this quite often just to kind of share what we're learning along the way. We love to um, share the kinds of things that we learn from our relationships with communities. Um, but we do that also through some technology-based tools, um, specifically our platform called Partner, which is, you'll see the acronym there is written out, the pro platform to analyze, record, and track networks to enhance relationships. And it's, um, we'd love for you to explore more about that when you have time, but it's really um, an ecosystem data tracking and learning tool that lets people um, track their networks over time and learn from them. Um, and we hope it provides insights to strengthen the impact um, for outcomes uh, for people at the individual level and the systems level. Um, okay, so one thing, uh, so today we're going to um, share a number of uh, topics and uh, things to cover today. We're going to share information about the topic, hopefully engage partners, and talk about ways for you to tell your story. Um, so one thing that I think might be missing here is, um, Alex, my mentee slide. So I need to, can you, I don't know if you can put it in there. So one of my favorite things um, to do is actually get- um, Oh, it's at the end, Danielle. That's okay, all. thanks. That's the last slide. Um, we just love, so we know that the people who have, are attending here today are doing amazing things out in the world. And we absolutely want to make sure that we're covering, um, or sorry, engaging and communicating and finding out who these folks are. So I want you to do a couple of things. So one, I'm hoping you'll go into the chat and introduce yourself and say hi, who you are and why you're here. But we love to do these mentees because it gives us, uh, we call it a visible us moment. So it lets us see who's here. So I'm going to ask you to capture this QR code, go over to your mentee, or you can go to mentee.com and put in this code 52403367. And um, with that, you can answer two questions. And so the first one, we just love to see who is in the room, who is here today. Um, and I know we all have titles. Mine I listed mine off at the beginning, but what we really think is fun is if you will list, and this is a word cloud, three words that describe you. And really these are like adjectives about you. You know, you can say what your job is, maybe talk about family, what adjective describes you, what's your hobby. So for an example, you might say, I'm a teacher and uncle and carefree and I'm a painter. Um, so we just do this every webinar just to kind of for fun to see what people are interested in and how they describe themselves. The second one is going to be, what is your experience with marketing or branding your network? And that's open-ended in just a few words. And what we'll want to do there is just what we're trying to do is kind of get a sense of like, how are people thinking about this kind of thing? Here we go. Every time I do something live, I worry it's not going to work, but I think it's working. <laughs> All right. So let's see who's here today. Thank you for filling it out. Um, all right. Um, great. So we have a few different things. 
Yay. I love we have an AMP-V. I'm not sure what AMP-V really stands for, but this is wonderful. Um, great. So we have communicators, researchers, volunteers, collaborators, um, a mom to two, mountain bikers, psychologists, network weavers, Filipino-American coalition builder, an aspiring quilter. Awesome. I would put Gardner in there if I was if I was doing this, but I'd have to share my screen and show you. Um, a history buff, avid cook. Awesome. So what we do know is that everyone here is somehow interested in networks and also kind of interested in marketing and branding your network and thinking about why that might be important. But here is who we also are. So thank you for taking a second to do this. It's really awesome um, to see everybody's um, kind of input on on how we describe ourselves. We'll share these when we share the slides after we'll include these in there. So you'll get to kind of take another look. So we've got fathers and moms. Awesome. Nurse. All right. Connectors and singers. Degrowth or I don't know what that is. You'll have to say in the comments what that means. <laughs> okay. Next one. In a few words, what's your experience with marketing or branding your network? And this is where we're curious. We're, we're thinking, are people um, having good experience with this? Is it challenging? Has there been something that's been successful? You know, kind of what is your... Uh, experience with this. And as you're doing this, I will say I've been teaching in a school of public affairs for many years in the nonprofit concentration. And something I've learned by being now a business owner and in the nonprofit sector and working with networks is that in businesses, we are not shy about marketing and branding, but in networks and nonprofits, we are. And I always say to people, especially my students, we should not be shy about selling and marketing our mission. So I'm really excited about this topic because I feel like marketing and branding is something that we don't pay a lot of attention to in the social sector, in social impact as much, because we almost feel bad, like we're trying to sell something to someone. But I think it's a really important skill to think about and gain some resources on because selling our mission and doing good and shouting from the rooftops about it and branding it is so important to the actual outcomes. All right, so a few things here, very limited, doing basics, but could do so much more, realizing I need a professional, very challenging. Okay, lots of folks who are, who are here exactly where I was when Alex raised his hand. We were in a we were in a, a meeting together and someone, a mentor looked at us, an advisor, and said, Who does your SEO? And I Googled SEO because I had no idea what it was. Alex said, I'll do it. And then he bought a few books, and that's where it all started. So um, where you all are mostly is where we have come from. And I can tell you, um, Alex has really gotten us uh, to the next level. Okay, well, thank you so much for participating, doing a few things. Don't forget to go in the chat and tell us who you are, hopefully by your title um, this time. And maybe you can um, let us know a little bit more about you. And so with that, um, we're going to go back here, but I am going to stop sharing, um, Alex, and I'll let you share uh, from your screen. So. Great. Thank you, Danielle. I'm just going to yeah. get this up on the screen here quick. Um, and then we'll dig in. All right. So hopefully um, you can all see my screen here. We'll just yeah we're just gonna go with that then perfect well thanks everyone for joining us um as danielle mentioned my name is alex durr uh I'm director of marketing and communications at, at vnl uh for i think i'm just coming up on about five years here uh which is wild um i think the the covid two years sort of just went by and you know like a moment but um uh, as danielle mentioned you know uh, my background is in um uh, not in in marketing. It's it's it political science and public affairs. Um, I came to to Colorado to get my master's in public administration and realized that the there really is this um, really interesting intersection, uh, you know, between sort of the the you know world of of public affairs and public policy and public impact, and then sort of the marketing and communications sphere. And so it's it's been something I've been very interested in, um, learned a lot, and and really sort of uh, focused in on sort of the network perspective of, you know, what what does marketing look like in a network environment or a coalition environment as compared to a typical nonprofit or, or government agency. So um, that's what we're going to be focusing on today. Um, hey, Alex, can you share your whole screen? Oh, am I not? 
Whoops. Nope. <laughs> it's perfect. Let me try that again. Oh no, I meant I meant go to presentation mode with your oh, yes. uh, presentation. Sorry to interrupt you. No, you're totally good. Um, yes, that will help everyone see it better. Sorry about this all. Uh, there we go. All right. Um, and Danielle, feel free to to pause me if there's any questions uh, in the in the chat. Um, so, um, marketing in a, a network. What what is involved here? Um, at the highest level, um, just to give us uh, all a little bit of a framework, so we know what we're talking about. Um, you know, I like to think about network communications in terms of you know, sort of the inward and the outward focus, um, because this is you know pretty much across all networks, coalitions, partnerships. You know, whatever you call yourself, if you're a, a group of partners coming together to do something, um, these these are the same dynamics that are going to be at play. So, um, you know, the first I, I think is what most people think of uh, just from my conversations, you know, when they're talking about network communication, um, you know, is is internal communication. Like how are all of the members of the network talking to each other? Um, and that's I mean, for for one reason, it's, it's sort of the first thing that just has to happen um, as you come together. Um, you're recruiting new members, you're onboarding people, you're sharing information. Um, that's all internal communications. And for a lot of networks, that's the heart of what they do. And so internal communications is really the focus. Um, and in this little network diagram, of course, you can see that going on with all of our internal interactions. Um, but the network itself is embedded in the larger community, right? Uh, and a lot of networks, that's the explicit goal is to actually change in some way uh, the the community or the larger system. And so that's when external communications or, you know, what we call marketing, sort of the big bad uh, word in, in some spheres. Um, it's really just, you know, engaging uh, with external partners. It's, it's sort of turning to the world and looking to build uh, you know, those partnerships externally as well as internally. And so, you know, that includes things like branding, which we'll talk about, um, but developing a marketing plan and goals, um, and, you know, engaging with other organizations um, and communities, audiences, um, telling your story, and of course, even influencing the public, which is a, often a, a big, uh, important task for networks. And so before you dig into the weeds and, and start talking about, you know, social media and, um, you know, messaging, the, the the first thing I tell people always to do is sort of take a step back um, and think about how marketing and communications, or as we lovingly call it, Marcom, um, how that can be a tool for your for your collaboration. Because just to be clear, marketing is not a strategy like you know itself. Uh, marketing is a tool, and you can do it strategically, um, but that requires a little bit of thinking, um, you know, and uh, question asking really to figure out uh, where the right mix is for your network because. If what works for one organization and one network, you know, this is a golden rule of networks, may not work for another. Uh, it really, really depends on on your history, your context, your goals, where you're you're going and where you've come from. So, you know, these are just some examples of questions um, I would recommend. But, you know, being clear about your, you know, your mission and your network priorities, I think that's really the the single most important thing. Uh, because if you're if your marketing plan doesn't support your network plan, it's it's a distraction and you're actually you know creating friction um you know i've seen groups that that uh spend a lot of time for example building out social media profiles and personas because they say well we that's what everyone does we need to have one but that's not necessarily true you know um there's there's times when that makes sense and there's times when it doesn't um similarly you want to consider who you're trying to talk to who are the the target audiences at play. Sometimes it might be decision makers. Other times it might just be the the members of your network. You know, if you're trying to share info, um, you want to think through your key messages. You know, what communication channels are most effective, uh, and especially which ones are used by those audiences you care about. Um, and then this is probably a, a very important one for networks uh, is thinking about how to keep your communication consistent and coordinated. You know, it's. It's one thing when you're in a, a large organization and you've got a marketing department or a communications team um, and they're doing that coordination work for you. Um, in a network, it's often right the network members who do the work. That's sort of the point. So um, that takes a little bit more um, you know, think thinking <laughs> to make, make that work out uh, in a network uh, environment. Um, 
And then lastly, you know, of course, we want to think about what resources we have, how we can engage these partners, you know, how we can use them um, and their skills and their resources. Um, and then lastly, how do we measure success? How do we know if this plan is working uh, and helping us achieve our mission or not? And we, we need to change. Um, and so I did want to show one example of a sort of a communication plan um, that I'm using. Um, when I'm not at VNL, I'm actually currently working with a coalition called the uh, Fix CRUS Coalition. Um, CRUS stands for the Colorado Recreational Use Statute. Um, and we are 28 organizations that uh, just formed in the last few months uh, to try to regain and restore public access to several closed 14ers. Um, if you're not from Colorado, a 14er is a 14,000 uh, foot uh, peak. We've got a bunch of them. They're you know, very popular for hiking, camping, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and there are five of them currently closed due to some uh, liability concerns. And so we've created a coalition to, you know, essentially address the situation uh, and, and uh, you know, make some policy changes uh, to fix the root of the problem. And so right away, we knew that, you know, Mar Marcom strategies were going to be very important for what we were doing since we are directly, you know, not just internally working together, but we're trying to externally you know, influence decision makers. And so um, the actual plan I'm not going to show because, you know, it wouldn't even fit on the screen. But in a nutshell, this is sort of to show you how this could work in practice, what we've done. Um, you know, internally, um, our goals really focus around sharing information and uh, resources with our members, you know, making sure all 28, I think 28 right now, um, make sure we all have the right messaging, that we're aligned, doing a lot of that coordination and alignment work. Um, and we we use a lot of tactics, you know, like our, our coalition newsletter, we hold monthly meetings, uh, we've got working groups meeting as well on, on specific topics. Uh, and then uh, we also use some different channels like LinkedIn and Slack um, and Google Drive to keep people on the same page. Um, externally though, you know, that's actually probably where most of our focus is um, since that's, you know, really our mission is to to change the, uh, you know, uh, the opinions of the public and also to drive some action among state lawmakers. So, um, you know, we're trying to inform the public and educate them uh, and spur action, you know, things like petitions, um, uh, press releases, we've shown up to legislator town halls, um, uh, and we're using a another whole range of tactics for that. Um, and so as you can see, depending on the goal you pick, you might end up going uh, with a very different set of tools and tactics. Um, a lot of people, I think, start at the bottom and work their way up. You know, they start by picking a tactic. And I think that the key is to really start with the goal um, uh, and how that fits in your larger strategy and then figure out what tactic works from there. Um, just to drive this point home a little bit, um, these are sort of, you know, uh, this is one um framework I've seen for uh, characterizing networks according to their goals. And so like the first the first category here are, you know, networks that are just trying to bring people together. That's really the goal is to have people, you know, start having conversations who were previously disconnected. And so, um, you know, in this case, obviously the internal communication is going to be sort of the, the main priority and focus area. You might have a lot more, you know, tactics at the, the top half of that that plan, you know, things like Slack channels, um, newsletters and, and uh, uh, social media groups that, pe that allow your members to all talk to each other. Um, but there might still be some limited need for external communications. You know, if you're recruiting members, if you're attracting resources, um, you know, even if that's not your priority, um, you need that to do the work. And so it may end up being sort of a secondary, um, you know, mission for your, your marketing communication work. Um, the second group here are alignment networks. These are ones where you're not just bringing people together and trying to connect them. You're actually trying to align them. You're trying to, to you know, share a, a single mindset or view when it comes to, um, you know, how they view the problem, how they uh, view a solution or an approach. Um, so they're still going to going out and doing their own work, but the network is doing the work of bringing you together and making sure you're on the same page. Um, and so I, I like to think of this as being sort of a 50-50 approach when it comes to communications, um, because again, internally, you're, you can't align people without having conversations and communicating. And so um, a lot of the same tactics uh, as before are still relevant. Um, however, um, alignment networks are also, you know, I think inherently there is an, an implication of action there. Um, it's more of a distributed action 
you know, for example, you might align all of your members and, and come up with a single goal like reducing um, uh, obesity in the community. Um, and you might align yourselves around the approach you use, uh, you know, but then you might actually all go out and, and, and sort of implement that on your own individually or in smaller groups. And so um, there still is that need for external communication, but it's very much balanced. Um, and then lastly, the production or, or action networks. Um, this is what I consider the the fix crust uh, coalition. Um, you know, these are really formed about going out and and taking some kind of action. Um, it's not just about connecting, um, and it's not just about aligning. There's certainly a lot of that that goes on. Um, but the ultimate goal is to actually then do something together, uh, whether it's creating a solution or making change. Um, and that's where external communication really becomes center stage. Uh, the sort of the pitfall of I think this group is that it's it's very easy to become entirely focused on the external communications, um, especially myself as like a branding person. Um, it's important to remember the the internal side of that piece still matters here. You know, sort of the the flip side of a connection network. Um, even though we are putting out lots of press releases, we're doing webinars and we're doing social media posts it's still critical that we're connecting all of our own members and getting them engaged with one another uh, because the combined activity of all of us, you know, all 28 of them is still going to uh, uh, rival what we can do together as one single coalition. And so um, I hope the, the takeaway is it's really a degree of emphasis that differs here. You know, you're always going to need some degree of both internal and external marketing. Um, it just might differ on, on the degree, depending on what your goal is. Now, this is a, a really common question I've seen online, um, and it's really quite simple. Do we need a brand, right? If, you know, we've created a coalition or a, an alliance or a network, um, you know, even if it's an informal one, um, as many are, do we need to name this thing? Do we need to create a logo for this thing? Um, do we need a brand? Um, and, and I want to be clear about what a brand is, because I think we think of it as being a logo. But a brand is really a collective identity. Um, it's the whole point of a brand is to, you know, in a logo, in your name, in your tone of voice and style, um, to convey things like the values you have, the mission you have, the vision you have, um, and your key objectives. And so uh, while a brand is a marketing tool, I think a brand is also a network tool, right? Because what is a network but a diverse set of values and missions and visions that are all trying to be brought together and, and be made into one sort of collective whole. You know, obviously every member of a network is always going to still have their own brand. You know, when you join join a coalition, you don't forego your own brand identity. However, I think a, a sort of a a network brand in, in a sense is actually a great example of emergence in practice of, of a network where you come together and, and might say, let's all sit at sit at the table and, and create something. Um, and no one would ever envision, you know, that a, a sort of a, a whole collective identity could emerge from it. And so um, in my experience, um, I'm sure there are some, uh, um, you know, exceptions there always are. But generally speaking, um, I do think a brand is helpful for almost one, uh, for almost every network or, or coalition. Um, and it's, it's, it's not as hard as I think, um, you know, some marketing consultants might make you think it is. So, um, some of the benefits though, and these are really specific, I think for networks here, um, you know, one is just that unified identity. When, when you're all sitting at a table and you're asking people to give their time, their commitment, their energy, their resources um, to a common cause, it can be difficult if there's no, there's no name or, or identity behind this common cause, right? Um, and so just, just by creating a, a common um, vision for what you all want to achieve together, um, it's going to facilitate more cohesive, you know, communication. It's going to keep people more engaged um, because for one thing, people will simply take it a little bit more seriously because it it appears to be more serious. Um, secondly is, is consistency of messaging. Um, this is a really big problem on, on really big and broad networks where, you know, you might have you know, over a hundred members and, and dozens of different working groups. Um, so how do you keep them all on the same page? How do you keep them all, you know, sharing the same messaging? Um, well, a brand can be very helpful um, because if you get everyone, you know, at a basic level on the same page of, 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 of tone, um, of style, um, of vision, you know, of object, of, uh, excuse me, objectives, 
you know, people can take those sort of cornerstones and use them as they need to, um, but still ensure that the final result matches and aligns and seems like it's still coming from the same group. So um, consistency is a, a, a big piece because anytime there's inconsistency in messaging, uh, you're, you're, as I call it, you're creating friction in the communication process and friction means, you know, less, less effectiveness. The, uh, the third big benefit for networks is shared recognition. Um, this is essentially a great tool for um, diffusing and avoiding conflict before it happens. A lot of organizations, you know, uh, depend on, you know, the, the credit and the, the um, recognition we rightly receive when we do something great, right? Um, you know, if a nonprofit uh, secures a massive new grant for the community, if a government um, agency, you know, makes major strides in disease control, you know, these are things we want, we want credit for. They help us secure more funding, more donations, community support, um, you know, lots of good things. Um, and so having a single network brand helps you essentially um, share credit for what's accomplished with all of your partners um, and avoid, you know, a situation where a minority of organizations kind of step in and start battling over turf credit um, and recognition. So this doesn't always happen. Uh, but, um, you know, I read a case study of, a you know, for example, a situation where um, a network organization uh, planned a press uh, conference, you know, announcing um, sort of a, a mission accomplished um, and didn't invite the other network organizations. And it ended up becoming such a big conflict, um, the whole group sort of disintegrated. And so, you know, branding your network early on can really help those conflicts, um, you know, once you have something to sort of go out to the world and, and brag about later on. Um, lastly, a, a strong brand is great for recruitment and growing the network uh, because a good rep reputation just makes makes the task of outreach, um, you know, a hundred, a hundred times easier. Um, when we got started with our coalition, we were actively going out and hunting down new members, looking for people who had, you know, a vested interest in the issue, um, who had um, expertise or skills or resources we thought would be valuable. Um, but because we did a really good job of um, getting the word out early on about our coalition, um, we are, we're at a point where now we've got a good number of people who are approaching us to join. Um, you know, we, uh, that's kind of what you want so that you're spending your time as a network, right? Thinking about like, well, who's not in the room who should be, right? Like from an equity lens, who doesn't have the time to come find us? We can focus on those people, right? Um, and so uh, that that's a, a big piece I don't think people think about, but anytime you save on on outreach can be spent on on doing things right so if you're like convinced now great brand sounds you know like a great idea how do i do this um there are four general easy steps um each of them could probably you know fill a book but uh it's really it's really pretty simple especially if you already know a bit about your network and your partners um you know and where you where you stand together um so first is the discovery and the research stage. You know, anytime you create a brand, um, you've probably got a reason why you're doing so, that network, you know, mission and objective. So um, keeping that in mind, you want to look at, well, what have similar groups done? You know, other organizations or um, networks or nonprofits in this space, um, what does their branding look like? You know, what, what do they call themselves? What terms do they use? Um, what tone of voice is their writing done in? Um, you know, there's thousands of examples you can do. Um, so I think if anything, I have problems ending this stage and moving on to the, the second, but um, it's great to just see a range of different options um, to sort of get your own creativity spinning. Um, the second step is strategy development. So this is really where you dig in on, um, uh, excuse me, how you dig into the the what of, of communicating, right? Um, if you're not in a sort of a marketing um, background, you might, um, you might not know these words. So I'll just do a quick explainer. Um, positioning is essentially a, a, a question of how your network, how your organization is positioned or comparable to another. And so this comes from the more competitive landscape of the private sector, right? Where every organization, you know, is defined by who it isn't, right? Almost in a sense. So, um, you know, if I'm selling a car, I want to say that this is the fastest and most affordable car, right? That's my positioning statement. And so when your network is coming out, you know, 
I don't think we we like to acknowledge it, but we are we are always competing for people's attention. That is inherent. Like attention is is a zero sum game, um, and we're also you know um, to a degree competing uh, for resources, for energy, for um, you know limelight in the public eye. So having a brand um, that is well positioned, right, compared to what other groups are doing. You know, for example, what's unique about your approach? You know, why is your network approach? special in some way compared to what with what's been done before um being on the same page about what that positioning statement is is critically important um the second is personality uh, that a little bit more obvious there but just what is the personality or the tone you want to convey do you want people to think you are authoritative you know very um informative and instructional or do they want something that's more friendly and welcoming and personable um that that's uh your choice to make, uh, depending on how you want it to connect to your goals. Um, the third is the promise. Um, you can think of this as like um, your guarantee to people who engage with you. You know, what will they experience? What will they learn? How, and what value will you provide? Which brings us to the fourth uh, fourth key thing you need to answer, which is your your values, right? Um, ideally, in a network. Um, you're having a, a conversation about values early on anyways. And so um, hopefully, even though this could be one of the more fraught um, parts of this process, because you may have people with different um, values. Um, as, a, as a quick example, you know, in our coalition, we have um, hiking groups and climbing groups. You know, we have the Trust for Public Lands uh, as a, a member. Uh, we also have mining consortiums as members. Uh, and if you work in environmental affairs, you know that the Trust for Public Lands and mining consortiums, um, you know, farm bureaus aren't big partners typically. And they do typically value things like conservation and, and preservation differently. And so being clear about what the core brand values are, you know, where the similarities are across all of you, that's pretty important. Um, and then third is where we get to the creative part. This is what I think most people think brand development is, even though most of the important, you know, the important uh, stuff happens in, in step two. Um, in step three, you're going to think about, okay, what is our brand name? Ideally, this will just be your network name or your coalition name, but it is important to think about things like, you know, is there already another organization that has a very similar name, right? Because then if, if someone's Googling our name, they're not going to find us. They're going to see this massive, you know, other organization. So you want to pick something unique, um, so that people can actually find you, so that you can actually stake out a claim, so to speak. Um, but it doesn't, it shouldn't be so unique that no one is is ever searching for that on their own, right? It's that middle ground where people who want to look for you find you, but that they can still stumble upon you too. Um, the second is a logo. Um, this is super easy to do online now. There are like thousands of logo tools. Um, the graphic design tool that you'll hear uh, for me over and over and over again is, is Canva. Um, just sort of the industry leader if you're not using uh, Photoshop and very intuitive and easy to use. Um, so highly recommend that. Uh, they even have logo templates. So you don't have to get started from scratch. You can use one of the logos they've created and then add it and customize it, add it uh, your own flair for your network. Um, the style choices uh, you wanna make include things like colors, um, the, the font choices, the type you use. Um, and then lastly, the imagery, um, you know, are you using um, pho photographs, realistic images, or are you using like cartoons and designs? Um, the, it's, it's less important specifically what you pick. I think the key is, do you have resources? You know, for example, do you have like a Canva, um, you know, account? And you know that you can get more graphics, more styles, more photos of that style so that it's consistent. Um, consistency is if, you know, if you're working on a, on a budget, that's probably the most important thing. Cause if you do all this work to create a brand and then you can't find any assets to use that match it, that are affordable, um, you know, that's probably not going to work. Um, lastly is your brand voice. This is really just taking the personality we talked about earlier and instituting it, you know, through words, um, you know, uh, uh tone layout, styling, all that kind of stuff. Um, all right. The fourth step is then just launching it, right? Um, it, it, it's really an opportunity to create a little bit of hype around your network, uh, launching your brand. Um, we often talk about early wins in a network uh, as being very important um, because they help essentially prove, prove the approach to the members, right? When you have an early win, 
Um, it's a great way to build excitement, keep people engaged, um, and and avoid sort of the burnout, the fizzle out that often occurs in a network. Um, and so, um, yeah, hype up that brand launch. You know, don't skip it. Don't do it without anyone noticing. Make sure people know that you've launched. So now we're going to dig a little bit into the tactics here, and there's a whole list of them. Um, and unfortunately, I won't have time to sort of dig into each one. And so I'm going to do a quick sort of you know overview of some of these. Um, and if people do have questions, if you have comments, you'd like to learn more, um, please do just reach out to us um, after the webinar. Um, we will be sharing uh, a copy of the slides and the presentation so you can rewatch it. And if you have any questions or you, you'd like to learn more about one or two or three of these, um, just shoot me an email and I am happy to, uh, to provide some more detail. So on the internal communication side, um, you know, these these tactics are all really about keeping the, the members of your network on the same page, um, sharing information, um, keeping things transparent. And the one, the one sort of strategic piece I would add here is the importance of uh, transparency and decision-making, right? Um, not all members of your network will want to be involved in every decision-making, um, you know, episode. That's, that's something that actually surprised me going through this coalition building experience, you know, um, my, Experience is that people always want more, um, more say in things. And so um, it's interesting to watch people actually self-select out and say, no, I, I don't need to have a say in that. Um, however, everybody wants to be informed of what the decision ultimately is, you know, even if they didn't necessarily, you know, demand a spot at the table. Um, there's nothing worse than finding out about a decision months after it was made. Um, so make sure you're sharing information on, on what decisions are being made and, and why. That's probably the single you know, most important internal communication tip just to avoid conflict again uh, and, and uh, avoid friction in internal communications. So um, some of these tactics, um, you know, I recommend and we've used, you know, one is a coalition newsletter. Um, it's probably the easiest thing on the list. Um, there are lots of free email newsletter programs like MailChimp. Uh, I think you get up to like 100 free members. And so as long as your network doesn't have 100 you know, organizations, which most don't, um, you can use something like that for free to send out an email newsletter with updates, articles, you know, uh, minutes from your uh, meetings, um, you know, to keep people engaged. Speaking of which, network meetings, they're probably the oldest and most basic way to, you know, internally communicate, but they still, they still do a great job. Um, the, the key to meetings are to let people know that they're always invited. You know, most meetings should be open invite. However, also let people know that they're not necessarily expected to show up unless they want to or unless they are specifically invited. I think that's the key balancing act, right? That people people want to show up if they have a specific role to play or a skill to play. Um, but if you're just inviting them because you are worried they're going to feel put off, um, if they don't get an invite, you know, I think we can all reflect on our own experiences of being super, super busy, we know that that isn't true ourselves, that we we often know we don't get invited to something and we're thankful for it, you know? Um, oh, wow, I have an extra two hours in my afternoon, you know? Um, so don't, don't feel the need to invite everyone to everything. Um, just let people know they can go if they want to. Um, working groups are essentially the same thing. It's just the idea of, of uh, setting up a small subgroup within your coalition or within your network to sort of delve into topics or issues that pop up throughout your, your time of working together that need to be a little bit more uh, more explored and researched. And then they can bring that uh, information back to the full meeting uh, later on. So uh, right now we have you know a, a legislative affairs working group and they're working on like our, our bill writing. Uh, and then we have a communications working group that's working on our, you know, um, all of the stuff I'm talking about here, um, you know, and so forth. Um, Slack channels and instant messaging, not much to be said there other than that it's great for keeping people um, up to date. Just be aware that not everyone likes Slack, not everyone has it. And so if you do use it, you may have to share information through multiple channels, you know, through email and Slack, for example. Um, and you might have issues with, you know, people seeing stuff on Slack that hasn't been said on email. And so those are the sort of thi things you have to keep in mind with internal communication is, you know, where, you know, where am I creating gaps on accident when I introduce these new channels? Um, shared Google drives are sort of a, an easy no brainer, uh, just a good place to put notes, minutes, 
um, other documents uh, to share. Um, social media groups, especially on LinkedIn, just because uh, it's seen to be a little more professional than Facebook. Um, those are great for, for collaboration. Um, and then onboarding emails. Um, this is something we're playing around with. Um, we've essentially got uh, the cheapest email uh, MailChimp account. And so we've uh, created a, a series of onboarding um, you know, email designs that go out to new members of our coalition um, you know, once we add them, that tells a, a little bit about the, the history of the issue we're solving, since a lot of people, you know, they're new to this, um, and, and introduce them to some of the members, introduce them to our core committee, and, and uh, give them some options, you know, for example, the different working groups on how to engage. And so having those, those emails and having the process of them being sent automated through that, that system is very nice because it means by time we actually get on a, on a call with them for our first one-to-one, -one, they've got a lot of the, the key background information. And they also even know about options for like working groups, you know, how could they get involved? Um, the key here though, like I said, is really the focus on a balanced approach. Because again, if you invite everyone to everything and you email everyone about everything, um, you know, that's information overload. So try to figure out what is the essential information that does have to always go out, things like major decisions that have been made, as opposed to things that are more working group level, right? Like we could set up a, a sub Slack channel for that and discuss that. It's there if you want it, not everyone has to go. Now on the external communication side of things, um, this is uh, what we've really been delving into a lot in our coalition. So, you know, um, the public newsletter is the same same side of, of or same thing as uh, with uh, the internal communications, but this one is meant to be for the public, you know, so people can register on our website. Um, they can also request email updates. Um, and uh, we share once a month information on what we're doing, you know, how people can get engaged, how they can, um, you know, take grassroots action in support of the work we're doing. Um, and that has been a very powerful tool. Um, webinars, like sort of like the one we're doing today, as well as podcasts. Um, these are two super um, interactive forms of communication that I don't actually see a ton of networks using these. Um, and I think it, there's a ton of potential because in terms of a, um, a cost benefit uh, perspective, um, they're, they're hard to beat. Uh, webinar software is pretty affordable. You know, there's a lot of tools out there for uh, less than $100 a month. Uh, and most coalitions are going to have an organization that's willing to foot $100 a month, you know, bill that's you're talking about a thousand bucks a year. Um, a podcast is even cheaper. Um, podcasts really only require some, some very limited editing software, a microphone and some time and effort. And so if you're looking for a way to educate people to do some longer form, more detailed content, um, webinars and podcasts are excellent options. And they have the the webinars have a, a great side effect or, or side benefit of, you know, you you do connect with people via email. So you have the chance, um, you know, to also add them to your email newsletter, uh, to do more personalized follow-up, um, that kind of thing. So um, blogs and infographics are also in this vein, they're a little less engaging. You know, when we post a blog compared to a video, we definitely see much higher engagement rates with the video. But blogs and infographics definitely still have uh, have their place. Um, and with blogs specifically, I should say, um, they're great for SEO optimization. Um, I didn't put that on here because it's sort of built into all of these things. But um, you know, it's still easier for a a blog in many cases to be picked up uh, by Google and, and uh, rank successfully uh, so that people you know click it um, as opposed to a video if you're if you're new to it. Um, there's a lot of different outreach tactics uh, where you're actually trying to go out into the community and, you know, bring your message to people. Um, a couple of easy ways to do this is, you know, through guest opportunities, you know, on, on blogs and webinars and podcasts, just identify a, you know, a podcast or a webinar that you think their audience is similar to your own. You know, you're trying to reach the people they reach um, and, you know, email them, give them a call, introduce yourself. Um, this is where having a external facing brand, right, is very helpful because when you approach a group like this, you know, we've done this once or twice already, uh, the cross, Fixed Cross Coalition, uh, when you've got a great looking brand, uh, logo, name, uh, positioning statement, and a, a lot of good members, it, it's much easier to, you know, have people say, yes, we'll have you on our podcast or our webinar um, or so on and so forth. So 
uh, events and conferences are great, you know, tabling as a sponsor um, or just attending to network. Um, advertising is pricey. However, especially if you're like working in the sort of policy change arena, um, it's, it's, you know, really necessary uh, to get your, your, um, your message into the masses. If you're talking about thousands, you know, tens of thousands of people. Um, but it also might just not at all be something you need to worry about if you're a network that is focused on alignment and information sharing, um, and you're not really an action oriented network, then advertising is just probably something you're never really going to need to worry about. And then lastly, there's this whole sort of world of press relations and, and publicity and PR. Um, the easiest thing you can do is, is just write up a press release from time to time when you have something that's happened. Um, this is a powerful way to sort of take control over your network story um, in terms of how it's framed, of, of who the villain of your story is, who the hero is, you know, what is the uh, um, the battle or the struggle that you are engaged with. You know, these, these are um, all just made for, for uh, media relations. Um, and so I, I'll specifically point at that if you have a coalition with a lot of members, take the time to make sure you know who's connected to the media, you know, do people have established contacts with major newspaper writers or, um, you know, news channels? Because those are definitely relationships the whole coalition uh, can leverage if uh, that group is comfortable doing so. That's a, a huge, uh, huge network leveraging point. I wanted to share a few network specific examples here too, um, because unlike, you know, uh, a typical nonprofit, you know, you've, you've not only have your own coalition resources as an entity, but you've got the sort of the skills and resources of all your various members. And so here's a few ideas on how you can sort of leverage those relationships in your, your marketing. Um, you know, one, you know, you can uh, look at a partner's organization and sort of share, share software. Like if they have a Hootsuite account they already pay for um, and it has excess, you know, space, you're still able to, you uh, um, add more accounts, you might ask if you're able to use that in as an in-kind donation. Um, you could also do what we're doing with a make a Marcom working group, kind of bring together various people from different organizations who all have some experience in comms to share duties, responsibilities, brainstorm ideas, um, et cetera. Um, third is identifying partners who work in IT or do blogging or web development. Um, because you might be able to, you know, build a website for free as opposed to hiring someone for, you know, several thousand dollars to do it. Um, it's it's important to draw on all of your partner's data so you can better understand your target audience. You know, if you have a group in your network that is working closely face to face, you know, with that target audience, um, it, you probably want to bring them in and, and really talk to them a lot with, you know, interviews um, to, to figure out what the needs and interests of, of that target audience are. Um, it's also a very easy thing to ask all of your partner organizations to link back to the, the network or the coalition website, um, because this will boost your Google performance significantly. Um, the links are essentially uh, a, a sign to Google that this website provides value, right? These people linked to this site because they probably, they were valuable in some way. And so uh, if you get a lot of those, um, you know, your your rankings will go up and you will get more, more traffic and build more awareness. Um, and then lastly, um, on the, the point about, you know, guest blogs and, and guest webinars, um, you know, you can have a lot of your partners be guests, right? You can do, a, you know, a coalition um, newsletter. Um, you can do a coalition um, uh you know, all kinds of different publications and, and share that content. Um, so we're gonna finish up here in about four minutes and then we'll have a few minutes for questions. Um, I did just see one question come in. Um, somebody asked, how do, how do you balance your personal brand versus the project's brand or the project's brand, especially when the project size is small? Um, good question. And I think that is uh, uh, sort of a, so it's a good question more broadly too about boundaries. You know, when, when does like the, org, how does a, the, an organizational brand rub up against the network brand, right? You know, so for example, we were just listed in a newspaper article um, in the Denver Post um, and he mentioned our, the whole coalition. And then he named a few members uh, of the coalition, some of the more high profile ones, but not all of them. Um, and that caused a tiny bit of, a little bit of friction, not enough to really be worried about, but it was enough to be mentioned by a member that, you know, they were 
kind of hoping that they would also get a mention there. And so I do think that that, like, the, I wish I had an easy tip for you on how to do that. I think it's difficult uh, because I think depending on the partners, some people will be okay more with like emphasizing the network or the project brand and putting aside the individual, the personal organization brand. Um, I call those the like the real team players where they care less about credit and more about just getting getting things done. Um, but you may be in an, in an opposite situation where you have some very high profile, uh, influential partners, and they expect some degree of credit for what they're putting in. And so it's that's tough. It's it's really where you know having someone with good facilitation skills on your team is is helpful to work through um, those conflicts. Um, but in general, I would say the more that you can make the network brand or the project brand really the focus um, whenever that is the conversation um, and, and only bringing up your your personal brand uh, sort of as a supplementary to the, the larger brand. I think that's the key. Um, it's still OK, for example, to like, you know, I write articles um, through my organization about the work of our our broader coalition. Right. But I'm not necessarily claiming sole credit. I'm only talking about specifically what have I done to contribute to the larger network, like, uh, you know, design the website, you know, saying I designed the website. It's not stealing credit from anyone. And so that's something that that's not going to be taken probably as aggressively um, by the others. But um, hopefully that helps. Um, the other comment on just selecting a social network, uh, I think it totally depends on what your target audience is using. Um, I think that's the key question. If you're trying to reach um, you know, young people, uh, if you are working in education, for example, um, you know, you're probably going to want to look at TikTok and Instagram. Um, if you are trying to reach older Americans, um, then Facebook and LinkedIn are probably better bets. So I, I agree that it is better to pick one or two that really fit for your audience rather than trying to be on all five, all 10, because that's just not easy to do. All right, so we just got like two more slides. I'm gonna rush through here and then we will have some time for Q&A. So um, a lot of people ask for tools and I'm not gonna run through this list um, verbally because it would take 10 minutes, but we'll send out a, uh, you know, a copy of these slides. These are all some good, uh, good tools and software options for marketing and communications that I recommend um, based on, on essentially cost. So that none, none of these tools are very expensive um, and so they're, they're not gonna break your bank. Um, I will, uh, um, yeah, I will let y'all read through that and, and, and check it out in the email we send later so we can get one or two more slides in here. So, um, one last thing I want to cover is just how network science, you know, what we do here at VNA or VNL, um, also can help you co uh, communicate effectively. Um, uh, in fact, you know, sort of mapping the flow of information, uh, across a network is one of the most common applications of, uh, network science. And so, just four examples of how you you can you know map a network and map relationships um, in a marketing sort of uh, scenario. Uh, you know, first of all, you can identify who in your network is the most well connected. You know, who are sort of the key nodes where um, you know if I want to push information out across uh, the community, these people are particularly well suited to do that. They you know based on who they are connected to and what in what ways. Um, you can also identify people who are sort of gatekeepers, right? They have access to a particular community or a particular audience that's hard to reach. Um, third is, is you can see where there are gaps. You know, if you're wondering why a certain sector um, or a certain type of organization just doesn't seem to be, you know, in sync with, with the rest of your network, you can really literally look up the, the web of relationships and see, well, maybe it's because there are some big gaps between them and us. You know, maybe they don't trust uh, a lot of the organizations that they're connected to, which means they're they're never opening emails from them. Um, and then lastly, you can identify what communication channels are most effective, uh, depending on you know who's connected to who and in what way. And so, just as an example of this, you know, uh, this is a a simple network map we use to to sort of demonstrate these concepts. But in this case, you can see that like the the homeless shelter right here is sort of a a, a gatekeeper node. Uh, you know, if the substance abuse clinic here, if they want to get information to the Salvation Army or to the business owner here, they have to go through the homeless shelter. And so they need to make sure that they're using, for example, a communication channel the homeless shelter prefers and will read and will will act on. So um, the one thing we probably won't have much time for is we were just going to talk a little bit about assessing uh, your, you know, marketing communications success, like how successful has it been? I think the key is 
don't wait, you know, have a plan for evaluation up front so you know what to do and, and consider things like what metrics you're going to use, what data you're going to look at. Um, you know, I think the big things to assess here specifically are your message, you know, is the message working or not? Are you saying the right thing? Um, the mediums, you know, are you using the right channels like email versus social media? Um, are you reaching the right audience or is, is it the right audience in the first place? Um, timing, you know, how is the coordination of all this working? And then lastly, are you using all your, your resources efficiently? So um, I think this is the last slide I had here. Yes, this is the last slide, just 10 pitfalls. These are things that um, commonly can, you know, cause problems specifically in a network. Um, you know, I think one is diversity of stakeholders, like we said, just getting everyone on the same page um, and keeping messaging consistent. Those are probably the biggest challenges. Um, resource constraints are, and decision-making delays are both sort of operational issues that come up when you're, you know, having to get group buy-in on these things. Um, communication gaps, definitely something to watch out for, although social network uh, analysis and mapping can help you, you know, identify those and, and deal with those. Um, the assessment piece of evaluation, that could sometimes be a challenge if you're new to it. Um, keeping your members engaged is huge, but I think a lot of these tactics we've gone through can help a lot with that engagement piece. Um, integrating technology, especially if your different partners have different databases and different, you know, CRMs that can be complicated. Um, and then of course, navigating politics and, and sharing this, this brand together, as you can imagine, gets complicated. So, um, I had to rush through the last couple of slides there. So I, I hope that was all right. But, uh, um, as I said, we'll be sending out all these slides. So if people want to dig through them a bit in more detail, um, or rewatch the recording, um, or just reach out if you have any questions too. Um, happy to help. So I think we've got a couple minutes, hopefully, for some Q&A left. Yeah, and Alex, thank you so much. Um, I think uh, everything that you covered is exceptionally helpful. And I think, you know, I'm just going to echo again how good Alex is at thinking about this and his added experience now of running a network, which has been a new thing and he is an exceptional network leader at this point is just a value add to all of this so very exciting um i don't see any other um questions in the chat but i just want to so i'm just going to ask one thing real quick alex if everyone yeah. could just do one thing today um with without really having to raise any money to help their marketing and brand um what would you suggest what is the most low-hanging thing that someone could do next Oh, wow. That's a good question. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's, <laughs> it's great. Honestly, I think it comes back to the branding piece. I think, you know, a lot of networks I've seen brands, you know, have a brand. I've seen a lot though that don't have any kind of a brand. Um, and I think it's just, it's like a missed opportunity because even if you don't see the obvious need for it in the moment, um, you know, I, we've had, again, we've had partners discover us on their own and ask to join that we never would have even thought of reaching out to. Um, we've even had like funding sources pop up, you know, not, not as much as we'd want, but more than we expected. And so, um, I, I feel like, um, it really is, uh, you know, putting a, like a brand on your network is almost the equivalent of like moving into a new neighborhood and like putting up a sign in the neighborhood. That's like, hi, we're new, you know, here's our name. We'd love to meet you. Like come by and you know, drop off a fruit basket, you know, so, um, or rather we'll, we have a fruit basket for you. So I think, yeah, yeah, just branding yourself and making yourself known and available so that people can connect with you. Um, cause that's what it's all about. Yeah. Good. Making yourself present. And our friend Stacy, um, from Canada also suggested oh. phone someone in your network today. <laughs> so, well, and I, let me just say, actually on that point, you're right. Like I focus so much today on organizational communication, we could do a whole nother webinar and the importance of like everything I said matters and it's, it, it's worthless if you're not doing the face-to-face, -face, you know, interpersonal, right. Like phone calls like that. I mean it. Uh, she's totally right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining and Alex for your time and preparation and um, all your work that you do with us. So um, thanks everyone. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Bye.